Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to present the first intimate panel on the Queen Parenting Conference, especially after this moving introduction of Christina. And this morning, uh, my colleagues will present the results uh, of the study on surrogacy. Pablo Pérez Navarro will talk about the study conducted in Spain, Tatiana Motterle in Italy, and Ana Lucia Santos in Portugal. The objective of the study was to explore the topics of choice, care, and rights of LGBT citizens in becoming parents, considering that the three countries present different legal frameworks on same-sex parenting. Therefore, for the study on, sur on surrogacy, the intimate team gathered gay men narratives to understand how they became fathers in Southern Europe and how this choice affected their daily life. I don't want to take too much time, so after the presentation we will be able to have almost half an hour of debate. And I give right away the floor to Pablo Perez Navarro. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm nervous for being the first for the session. Um, I would like to start with this news which appeared a couple of months ago, coming from the south of Spain, when I was already preparing the, this paper. You can see the, the headline there, which is in English in that corner, which says, a male couple and one mother have been detained for the sale of a baby born through gestational surrogacy. With its weirdly long formulation, this headline offers uh, two interesting conceptual opposition. The first one between a male couple, of whom we cannot anticipate whether they are the intended parents, members of a human trafficking mafia, or both, and a woman who is no longer one, but just a mother. The second one suggests two possible narratives for the same facts. One in which the expression sale of a baby makes sense, and another one in which gestational surrogacy makes sense. When both oppositions are considered, a certain assemblage of cultural anxieties emerges. Are not the so-called intended parents people who buy the babies they cannot have by, the, by themselves? Does not gestation necessarily lead to becoming a mother? Are not gestational carriers in fact mothers who sell their, their offspring? Well, nowadays, gestational surrogacy contracts are not legal in Spain. They are not of a criminal nature either, they just lack, lack any legal effects. As a result, more than 1,000 intended parents, heterosexuals for the most part, travel every year to countries where surrogacy is legal. And in the case of male couples, the possibilities are drastically reduced. In the words of Miguel, who could opt for surrogacy in the US when an unexpected inheritance gave him the chance to afford it. Uh, money is the biggest handicap, of course. Not everyone can invest the amount of money that is needed to do it in the US. To do it in, a, in another country, well, there are risks in doing it, in, doing it in, a, in other countries. We rejected that risk in each country for a different reason. Frequently, the intended parents assume long-term debt during the surrogacy process, in the words of another participant in the study, we are middle class people, we have good jobs, and we have relied upon the help of our families. Basically, we had some savings and we asked for a quite a lot of money to our sister and a credit to the bank. We do not have all the money yet, obviously. It was like more than five years later. We still owe money to our families. The expenses are related with many different fronts. Let's just say that medical care in cases of preterm birth, for example, uh, can destabilize even the most uh, excessive, apparently excessive, provision of costs. But the emotional costs are not any less important. Uh, Miguel again. There are high economic and emotional costs. When things go wrong is when you notice it the most. Our children were born at the fourth try, the fourth try, after one abortion and with a second egg donation. It is very hard, 
and sometimes you wonder if, emotionally speaking, it is worth the effort. Actually, the, the mix of emotional and political issues involved has led some authors to prefer the term reproductive exile to alternatives such as reproductive tourism or the perhaps too aseptic cross-border reproductive care. In what follows, I will use the phrase in reproductive exile in, in order to highlight the political dimensions involved and in the understanding of exile as an expulsion of the national territory through means that may include, but are not limited to, relegation, estrangement, deportation, or other legal means. But you know, you, we may be, you, you may ask, uh, how is that anyone coming from Spain needs to become a reproductive exile? You know, Spain, the proud host of the next uh, World Pride. Well, to contextualize a bit, gay marriage was approved uh, more than a decade ago, 2005. Spain was the first country to approve marriage and gay adoption at the very same time. Moreover, Spain uh, hosts reproductive exiles coming from many other countries, mostly lesbian couples and single women. It would seem that non traditional reproduction and parenting have achieved some kind of formal equality in contemporary Spain. However, a closer look with the help of queer reproductive practices can help to understand the extent to which that has never been the case. Lesbian motherhood is a case in point. Double maternity since the moment of birth is only possible when the mothers are married with one another and even in those cases only when certain conditions uh, apply. Uh, this, this condition has no parallel at all in the case of heterosexual relationships. Filiations with two fathers since the moment of birth are not any less eloquent at this regard. Um, it was the anthropologist Adam Goodfellow who, I think I already passed this a good deal. Okay, who in his ten-year-long ethnography on gay parenting said that the families of gay men with children draw into sharp relief the skepticism that accompanies legal and biological regimes that foreground kinship in everyday life and relations. Certainly, in the light of the treatment given to gay affiliations resulting from gestational surrogacy it would seem like the Spanish state is really committed to prove that claim right. One tragic example is the case referred in the journal that I referred to at the beginning of the presentation. The skepticism over the gay kinship reached there the extreme of separating the child from the intended parent and transferring it to a juvenile center while awaiting for the trial. But there is, yet, there is yet another case in which gay affiliations are being also pushed to that field of unintelligibility that Judith Butler described as the irrecoverable and irreversible past of legitimacy. There never will be, there never was. This one was originated in 2009 when another male couple went to the Spanish consulate in California to register their the children. Before them, many straight couples had never faced a problem whatsoever, even in those cases in which the dates of birth and the dates of the travel uh, did, did not match, in the sense that made, they made evident the intervention of gestational surrogacy. In the words of one of the fathers, which I didn't interview, hypocrisy had been greasy in the system, but we were the grain of sand that made it jam. The consulate actually refused to recognize the affiliation as it was already regi registered in the US and from that moment on other parents found themselves and children in the same judicial, hostile judicial limbo. Fortunately, specific regulations of the Spanish registry and two sentences of the European Court of Human Rights against uh, Italy and France uh, had been facilitating all these administrative procedures. But nonetheless, in the meantime, the so-called uh, zero case has received only negative court rulings in its way up to the Constitutional Tribunal, which is what it is right now. Uh, the arguments held by the courts show how gestational surrogacy, in the absence of the figure of the mother, brings the whole biological ontology of the human into crisis. For instance, 
one of these court ruling claim that this is an amazing phrase what is formally true given that it is registered as such by the Californian certification is not nor can it be in any material sense actually true given that it is biologically impossible thus leading to the existence of a doubt on the reality of the registered fact uh, but the Saint Papier child of gestational surrogacy is far from being, from being the only problem arising from cross-border reproductive practices as the editors of the collection Assisted Reproductive Technologies in the Global South and North explain while cross-border reproductive care extends the field of possibilities to conceive a baby it may create new problems and accentuate existing inequalities especially so with people from the Global North travel to countries of the Global South. But as I see it, given the growing importance of global reproductive politics and inequalities, there is a correspondingly urgent need for the critical analysis of the norms at play in the constitution of national reproductive systems, because they are the ones that originate reproductive exile in the first place. For that purpose, uh, Gail Rubin's influent is say, thinking sex, not for a radical theory of the politics, for politics sorry, of, of sexuality, to which the title of this uh, paper plays a humble tribute, uh, may serve as an inspiration. As she herself explained years later, the theoretical impulse of that work was never, as Anton and Duarte, including Judy Butler, interestingly, negating the close relations between gender and sexuality, but rather to show that the social life of sexuality could not be reduced to the social life of gender. By doing so, her work contested that of authors on the other, on the opposite side of the so-called sex wars, whose conservative readings of BDSM sexualities, pornography, and the like totally collapsed the category of sexuality into the language of gender oppression. Instead, Rubin offered a specific analysis of a sexual value system on the understanding that sexual hierarchies work in much the same ways as do ideological systems of racism, ethnocentrism, and religious chauvinism. According to Rubin's geometrical insights at the top of the erotic pyramid, which she never drew, but she drew this, which is an approximate idea, uh, we would find marital sex between reproductive heterosexuals. By introducing different variables in the sexual equation, we would progressively descend steps of social recognition. Unmarried but stable straight couples and casual straight sex would be followed by monogamous couples of gays and lesbians. Even lower, bar dykes and promiscuous gay men would appear. Much closer to the bottom, sex with or, with or within or between sorry, transsexual, transvestites, and involving money exchange would be followed by intergenerational relationships. Depending on the position, sexual practices would be exposed to different degrees of social stigmatization, institutional hostility, or plain criminalization. For our purposes, we may ask. Uh, what would the pyramid of, re of, the, of the reproductive value system look like? At the top, no doubt, we would find pretty much the same kind of activity. The sex value and the reproductive value systems intersect exactly where married and fertile heterosexuals are, followed uh, by those for whom birth control systems, both most recommended by the church, fail. And, not far from there, reproductive coitus between unmarried straight couples. Single women and lesbian uses of assisted reproductive, reproductive techniques would then appear by order of legitimacy. People considered to be too young or too old to reproduce, transgender reproductive practices, male pregnancy, and the like, and of course, reproduction involving money would belong to overlapping levels of the pyramid. And finally, queer co-parenting and sperm donors in non-commercial uh, cyber networks, embryos with genetic material of more than two people and or with genetic material from only same sex, uh, uh, sperm or eggs, to name a few, would be emerging surfaces of the same pyramid. 
depending on their position, reproductive practices receive different degrees of biopolitical vigilance in the form of a myriad regulations and prohibitions, sometimes leading, as, the case, as it is the case with gestational surrogacy, to the privilege-driven logics of homonormative exceptionalism. But you know, uh, as a result, partly as a result of this, in pretty much the same way that one side of the sex wars tended to reduce sexuality to gender relations, many contemporary analysis, analysis of reproduction do exactly the same thing with the category of kinship. For that kind of monocategorical analysis, women who abort are mothers. Women who donate uh, eggs are mothers. And women, of course, who gestate are mothers. It is in that sense that sometimes, despite themselves, it has been argued that social movements opposing surrogacy and abortion share overlapping narratives. Correspondingly, both of them rely on the mobilization of the stigma uh, of the bad mother who kills, sells, or abandons uh, her children. When it comes to counteract that stigma, relationships established between gestational carriers and intended families occupy a sort of strategic place. Studies show that long-term family-like relationships are indeed a very wide reality. And as an illustration, I let me say just, just say that the participants in the study maintain periodical contact, organize visits, and so on with the gestational carriers. Two of them even showed to me um, photo albums in which gestational carriers and their families occupy the prominent role, sub subverting to some extent the, the traditional family album, while at the same time somehow invoking its performative character to produce surrogacy-specific, kinship-like kinship -like visual narratives. But however, and as I see it, the strategic place of these relationships runs a certain risk. For me, this risk, this risk is that of reinforcing the double bind between reproduction and kinship. Sometimes, in the form of a longing for certain forms of still being able to do certain forms of kinship. I would like to have had a much better relation with the carrier. It makes me sad. I had idealized the fact that my sons were going to know the story of the woman who gestated them. For me, it had to be someone with which they could have contact. It is true that we have a relationship because once a month I send her a picture and she replies. But I know this. If I didn't write, she could not she would not come back to ask anything. Certainly this longing is directed, directed to something different to a mother-child relationship. But we can clearly perceive a morning, a certain morning for a kinship-like relationship that is just not there. From the point of view of our cyber-like relationships with the reproductive field, this morning may be the very same that underlies the cultural, and cultural anxieties arising by reproductive technologies, and more specifically, by the way, uh, these challenge the notion, the very notion of biological origins, including the construction of motherhood as origin. And at the end, paradoxically, reproductive forms of undoing kinship somewhat materialize the Edelman's rejection of reproductive futurism whenever a woman casually says of a child that she gestated, or even of the child, I've got no real feelings for him. I mean, like I say, he was my first, so I, al I always remember that, but apart from that, you know, Nothing really. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, so, uh, well, I will start uh, by presenting very briefly the Italian uh, context uh, on, as regards to uh, in, yeah. um, in Italy, surrogacy is completely illegal, uh, even its promotion. Uh, the, the ban on surrogacy is contained in Act, uh, 4 of 2000, in Act 40 of 2004, uh, which is the law that regulates arts in Italy. According to such law, uh, arts are permitted only to married or cohabiting heterosexual couples. So single people and same-sex couples have to go abroad to have children through arts. Uh, last year, during the parliamentary discussion on the bill that later became the first Italian law on same-sex same civil unions, Act 76, surrogacy was one of the main arguments used against the provision on stepchild adoption, who aimed to give couples in civil union the same rights of married different sex couples as regards co-adoption. That is the possibility for both members of the couple to be legally recognized as the parents of their own children. One of the, uh, one of the discourses against stepchild adoption basically asserted that it would legitimize gay men who did surrogacy abroad and to encourage more of them to do that. In this debate, inside and outside the parliament, feminist concepts were exploited by Catholic, conservative and right-wing politicians. Moreover, some, some feminists themselves took part in the fight against surrogacy, which, by the way, had been used by Italian heterosexual couples for the last decades, but didn't seem to be such a huge problem until now. Finally, as a result, stepchild adoption was eliminated from the bill. Anyway, in May 2016, the Italian Supreme Court ruled that uh, stepchild adoption is permitted and legal in particular cases. Uh, this decision simply confirmed what uh, was already happening in Italian courts with same-sex couples and uh, stepchild adoption. Uh, the debate on surrogacy is ongoing and is uh, splitting feminisms and LGBTQ movements in Italy and not only in Italy as we know. As regards my research, I will use uh, results from qualitative in-depth interviews with gay fathers who had surrogacy abroad, uh, mainly in the USA and Canada. So let me introduce my interviewees. All the data you see here are fully anonymized. Uh, they are Carlo, Filippo, Gianni, Michele and Vanni. All of them are cis men, white, abled, uh, coupled and born in Italy and all live in the capital Rome. Here, uh, the economic and class issue is crystal clear. These men are middle to upper class. However, there are important differences among their social economical situation. And for the majority of them, uh, recurring to surrogacy was a very meditative choice that entailed planning long-term financial strategies, sacrifices, as someone literally said, substantial changes in their daily lives. And uh, their experiences are very similar to that of uh, Pablo's interviewees. In the next minute, I would uh, like to describe some of the main issues that I found central and most interesting in these interviews. Issues that have to do with what we at Intimate call the re resilience of biology, that have to do with hetero and homonormativities, and finally with the familial relationships that uh, surrogacy practices uh, led to in the experience of these participants. So as regards to biological issue, it is a very complex, nuanced and uh, challenging one. If on the one hand in these interviews the common narrative sustains the unimportance of genetic uh, ties following the idea that it is love that makes a family, on the other hand the question of biology emerged with its complexity. For example, how did the participants choose who would be the biological father when they chose and didn't leave it to chance, or better, with which one to start, because in, in, indeed the idea of having more than uh, one child is generally shared. So the first biological father would be, in their experiences, the one who has an indeterminate term contract or can use at least parental leave, the most fertile one, the, the, with, with the best sperm motility, the oldest one, the one who gives more importance to, to blood ties and the one who wants more badly to give his parents a grandchild. 
Here, as you can see, except for the first two, which are more pragmatic, every motivation is more or less explicitly related to the importance given to genetic ties. For example, uh, why do couples start with the oldest member? Obviously because with age, the quality of sperm decreases, so he could risk losing the possibility of being a biological father. So this already tells us that the biological issue is not so neutral nor unimportant. Uh, Carlo and Sergio explicitly preferred to leave the insemination to chance. They asked to implant two embryos, as many people do, one for each sex, and each one genetically connected to each member of the couple, but only one embryo stuck. And he says, Carlo says, when we discovered the sex of the baby, then we also knew to whom Z was genetically linked. But I must say that this was a totally neutral information for us. It has always been, and it is definitely. But then he also told me, now we are thinking about the second one, and we have some frozen embryos. Well, we'll definitely implant an embryo that is biologically mine, so that we can do this alternation. So, as Mikhail Nebelin Petersen found in his research on Danish gay fathers through surrogacy, and I quote, they were turn-taking turn as a strategy to negotiate biogenetic relatedness, end quote. I find in Carlo's words this alternation between the narrative of the absolute neutrality of the biological issue and at the same time, and on the contrary, the surfacing of its importance. Here he insists on the fact that genetic links are not important at all to him and his partner, and I'm sure he's genuine and sincere about it. He says, I'm not Hilario's genetic father, but I just say that for the sake of the interview, because actually we don't mention it to anybody in order to not to give it importance, since we actually don't. To be really honest, I can say I completely forget about the genetic connection with Ilario. That is not an issue at all. But he also somehow contradicts himself through the discourse of physical similarities. He says, I mean, I see he, he looks like me too. Even if I don't see physical similarities, I expect to find some, some sooner or later. Filippo told me, it would be nice to have twins. Uh, his, he is describing a, a dialogue uh, between uh, he, uh, him and, and his partner. Uh, he says, it would be nice to have twins with my DNA, your DNA coexisting inside the same belly. Two brothers who are born together, who have my and your genetic makeup, who are brothers and twins. That is something that connects us too, since we can have a baby who is the result of my DNA and your DNA as it usually happens. This dreaming a bit could have been the closest thing. Here, genetic connection with children is described as a means of further connection between the fathers, employing a narrative of a naturalized heteronormativity, as it usually happens, or the closest thing, the closest thing to what? And I will here quote Daniel Ricks and Clemens Du when they talk about reproductive vulnerability. In a context where reproductive capacity has become a key marker of citizenship, and when such capacity is seen as diminished, then even though technologies are increasingly available to support reproduction in modes other than through heterosex, access to the cultural capital arising from reproductive capacity is hierarchized according to an individual's approximation to that which is still seen as emblematic of fertility, namely reproductive heterosex. Then the question of the desire, the necessity of giving a grandchild to one's parents. Here Gianni says, we both had a strong desire to become dads. He is older than me, so obviously the, the, the decision of starting with his sperm also came from this. I mean, he had a need, also because of his parents, he wanted to give them a grandchild. That was the priority. So this issue is very telling, in my opinion, since it shows how much biology is central, as a matter of fact. Is a non-genetically connected grandchild less a grandchild? Symbolic and legal questions mix here. For example, the issue of family name transmissions needs to be considered. Even though a very, very recent sentence of the court of Trento ruled that the children of a gay couple can, can have both father's surname, even the non-biological fathers, what usually happens is that uh, only the biological father is recognized as the legal one, so only his family name passes to the children. This can be a question of, a great, of great symbolic importance. But beyond the symbolic, we also should take into, co into consideration 
what this means legally. legally. Non-genetically linked parents, grandparents and other kin are not legally recognized as such in the case of non-heterosexual couples who had a stepchild adoption recognized. As regards normativities, uh, besides the usual, uh, usual institutional homophobic discrimination, these men had to deal with uh, their families of origins and friends when they decided to recur to surrogacy and during the whole process. Nobody described the huge conflicts, but even whether things generally ended positively, the whole process was not so uh, easy for everybody. Moreover, uh, a couple encountered, uh, for example, discriminations when interacting, inter interacting with the institutions, namely, namely with the registry office, and they were invisibilized as uh, gay fathers in the public space. However, what most of the participants were very eager to tell me was that they are very happy with the general attitude people have towards them, and they interpret that as a consequence of their normality. And when they talk about normality, they are describing homonormativity. Here, Filippo says, we never, never had any sort of problem. Maybe it is also because our appearance don't scare people. And Gianni also, he says, in the idea of, homos of a homosexual couple that wants to have children, that is very much the idea of a traditional family. We, um, he says, I mean, we go to work, we have a baby, our Saturday night's fun is going out for a pizza next to home. I mean, we look like many other families. I mean, we don't do strange or wild things. And Vanni articulates the question, and he says, I think homoparental families have a double face. I mean, without them fully recognizing, we destroy the concept of family as they would want it to be. And at the same time, we look, we look more like them, and then we become more acceptable. They see us closer to them, and this reassures them. They don't see us with feather boas, which is not a bad thing at all, on the contrary. <laughs> uh, Ex extended international families, uh, why I'm uh, talking about that. Participants highlighted the affective bonds and, and relationships they built with gestational carriers, as also Pablo already said, egg donor, uh, uh, they built these relationships with the gestational carriers, egg donors also, but to a lesser extent, and with their families, way before the childbirth. When describing the matching process with carriers and donors, Participants talk about a, a bi-directional uh, process where the main features they looked for and found in carriers and donors have to do with a commonality of beliefs and motivations. First of all, the will to get to know each other and to keep the relationship going after the children are born. In the USA and Canada, women who want to do surrogacy must have children of their own and all the women who had the interviewees were married. During pregnancy, the participants usually visited the, the gestational carriers, and in some cases the donors also. They got to know their families, children and husbands, sometimes their families of origin too. They built with them affective relationships that continued after the children were born, as Michele says here. A sense of family was created before the babies were born. The participants talked extensively about these relationships. Indeed, I had to choose among a huge amount of quotes on this topic. And uh, Pablo already talked about this, this, and there is a lot of interest in li literature about the naturity and the narratives of surrogates and intended parents, about how, for example, the rhetoric of the gift and of mutual affection between the parts are used to detach the process from its commercial nature, and so on. Uh, but I would like here to simply let some accounts about their personal experiences. So, for example, we have Filippo, he says, in December we stayed with them, we spent Christmas together, it was wonderful, it really felt like staying with the family. When we talk about Helen, we never separate her from Sean and Mark, who are uh, Helen's uh, husband and son. Her whole family participated and, and helped us with this project. And they still are now our full-fledged American family. Gianni says the day before we left to go back to Italy, we met her, the gestational carrier, together with Calogero, and she gave us a lot of little presents. And uh, she brought us pictures of her when she was pregnant, ecographies, things like that. And then all the presents from her children, a little hat, a handsome blanket made by her grandma. I always send her pictures of Calogero, I sent her one today with his new haircut. 
And then, uh, okay, we have uh, Michele's experience. Uh, he, he talks about the, the, the relationship there, also the relationship between the, his children uh, and uh, the, the children of the surrogate. So it's an evolving relationship and it evolves more and more as regards children now that they are more autonomous. It's a, a relationship they are building with their cousins. We call them cousins, I mean Brooke's children. And we like that. So we know what their children do and they know what our children do. So we accompany each other step by step. It feels like family. Finally, to conclude, through the narratives and experiences I gathered, it became very evident, evident that the array of different kinds of normativities, all of them, descending from the hegemonic heteronormative paradigm we live, all of us will live in, and the ways in which they are reproduced by the participants, who, taken as a whole, seem to represent a perfect bunch of, it, of homonormative guys. They are cis, they are white, able, wealthy, and so on. As a feminist researcher involved in transfeminist and queer radical politics, I am well aware of that, and it has been my main concern. But I'm also interested in, in uh, investigating whether and how, within homonormative experiences, norms can be maybe banned and challenged. So I found two points, among others, that I think may be worth more study. And I also want to contextualize here and to take into consideration the Italian context in particular, where not even same-sex stepchild adoption could become law, in part precisely because of the terror that gay fathers through surrogacy seem to inspire. So two points I said. One, first one, uh, can we talk about extending international families and could they change something in the Italian social and collective imagination about the traditional family. Indeed, this is not the traditional extended family we used to know, nor is the classical uh, family of choice described years ago by Kath Weston. These relationships are ongoing because real affective bonds were created, but also and mostly because from the beginning there was a common will to create it in order for children, fathers, surrogates and donors to keep in contact. In a context like the Italian one, where, as Chiara Bertone recalls, relationships with families of origin seem to occupy a central place in the lives of LGBT people, this could be an interesting matter of future research. Point two, are these gay fathers reconfiguring gender stereotypes and models of masculinities? Actually, in these accounts, I found a sort of reinforcement of gender roles through the idealization of the figure of the woman mother a reproduction of the gender stereotypes of the woman who knows by nature how to do that, how to, how to mother, and, how, and of, the ma of the men who don't, who don't know who, how to take care, uh, especially of baby born or baby child, of newborns. Indeed, many studies show us that although things have surely changed, social expectations about parenting are still very connected to binary gender roles and stereotypes. But at the same time, these fathers actually do all the care work, even the kind of care who men are not supposed to do. So could we expect and hope that visible couples of men or single men who parent and take care of their children somehow help with, dis uh, with disrupting this uh, configuration? I may be being very optimistic here, but who knows? And finally, how, how could I overlook the question of surrogacy? Pablo has already illustrated very well. Uh, I would just like to add that what I believe is missing, or at least not sufficiently visibilized in, in the Italian feminist debate on surrogacy, is a serious reflection about the subversive potential it could bring with it, for example, as regards the cultural and social construction of motherhood, often represented as a, an historical, universal, and natural configuration including and containing different physical and emotional experiences as, as if they were a unique phenomenon, a, a unique thing. Experiences like heterosexual sex and possibly love, pregnancy, child rearing. There are people who were assigned female at birth, were socialized as women and self-defined as women who love being pregnant but are not interested in child rearing. Others who totally reject the idea of pregnancy, even if they physically could do it, but want to parent, to do parenting. And clearly this doesn't regard cis women only, but Ana Lucia will explain that uh, much better than me. 
So if on the one hand, uh, surrogacy practices clearly show what Damien Riggs and Clemens do call reproductive vulnerability, on the other hand, they can also be thought as a way to re-signify the experiences and practices I described above from a feminist okay, so, uh, I Good morning, everyone. Okay. On the contrary to Tatiana and Pablo, I don't have uh, interviews with men who benefited from surrogacy. So I'll start with two different cases. Okay, I'll, I'll go. Uh, Alvaro is a 30 years old cisgender gay man who has, according to his own words, his biological clock. Pumping, pumping for a child. He is a very enthusiastic intended father. He admitted he would like to be a woman just to have the experience of being pregnant. He has two younger brothers, and when his mother and stepfather divorced, to, due to the medical condition of his mother, he took on the role of the caregiver of, at home. Not caregiver as in the head of the family, but in the same sense it has been recognized as, as a female phenomenon. <clears throat> Alvaro wants to have biological children, but since he is gay, the only way to achieve this desire is through, is through a surrogate contract. Although he is currently single, he dreams of a situation in which he can raise his child together with another man, and is making investments with money he needed in order to achieve the, the financial stability in order to, to access sur surrogacy. In Portugal, surrogacy is not allowed for cases like ours, but he guarantees that he will not wait for the perfect man, the same way he will not wait for any law to fulfill his dream. Okay. Everything's fine now. Uh, Joana uh, is a 29 years old cisgender woman who, similar to Alvaro, has a dream of having a biological child. Unlike Alvaro, Joanne is heterosexual, but she cannot bear a child because, like Alvaro, Joanne has no uterus. She defines herself as Rokitansky, which is a condition that causes the absence or underdevelopment of the uterus and vagina, but not affecting the ovaries. Joanne's sister is willing to bear a child for her. With those two factors, being a woman plus not having uh, a uterus and having someone willing to be her gestational carrier, Joana has now the possibility to apply for a surrogacy contract in Portugal. Although the birth rate in Portugal is in serious decrease and the state strives to implement incentives to increase it, none of them until last year include the sister reproductive technologies except when concerned different sex uh, couples. This illustrates an evident hierarchy concerning reproductive rights in Portugal, where only a couple of months ago, single women and same-sex married couples finally achieved the right to arts. When I say arts, I mean assisted reproduction, uh, reproductive technologies. In fact, as said by Dame Riggs and Clemens Dew, there are forms of reproduction uh, that are more valuable than others. Heterosexual reproduction, said to be the natural reproduction, is the most valuable type. In the lower positions, uh, we can find grading, grading scales, with gay men and single men forming the most vulnerable group, without the possibility of having biological children, unless, of course, traveling ab abroad, as shown uh, by my colleagues, with all the costs associated and facing enormous problems to register the child in the Portuguese consulate. In the opinion of George Gatto, psychologist interview for this case study, and he is somewhere in there, <laughs> um, gay men have to face more barriers when it comes to parenting issues. And quoting, parenting still belongs to the female domain. Men have to overcome more barriers because they are men and they are already breaching the rule of masculinity, not only in the heterosexual domain, but also within the LGBT community. And when comparing to lesbians, gay men want to have fewer children 
In principle, a woman can conceive, can carry out a pregnancy. A man cannot. He has to rely on third parties. In fact, cisgender gay men need a system to procreate. And in a legal, legally limited context like Portugal, plus the lack of public debate on the topic, it is no surprise that gay men do not even think about the possibility of becoming parents, fathers, uh, because if they cannot conceive, they cannot desire what is not even imaginable. For instance, Alvaro acknowledged, I didn't see myself not being a father, but I wasn't seeing any option. I didn't know this possibility. For me, a gay man, a gay man could never, could not be a father, never. Only through adoption, and even so, it was something very unlikely. Uh, the, the recent law uh, that was approved regulates the access to this reproductive method by women who, due to physical and medical conditions, cannot bear a child. Usually, only the absence of the uterus is mentioned, but it, also applied, it is also applied to other clinical situations that, uh, that will justify it. Um, and in the contract, it established that the surrogate cannot provide any genetic material, which means that this is a gestational surrogate and not a, a traditional uh, surrogacy. The contract must be supervised by the National Council for Medical Assisted Procreation, and it must include provisions in case of malformations of, or fetal disease, and in case of voluntary termination of pregnancy. It may not be imposed to the surrogate any restrictions of behavior or anything that goes against a rights, fundamental freedoms and dignity. Surrogate and beneficiaries must be informed about the influence of the surrogate in the embryonic and fetal development. Beyond these remaining aspects will only be written down in the contract by agreement with the parties involved. In the last 30 years, arts have challenged notions of procreate, on procreation, parenthood and family offering the possibility uh, to procreate outside the traditional context of heterosexuality. The first test to baby born in 1988 stirred the debate about social and ethical implications of assisted reproduction. But by now, arts, they are widely accepted and surrogacy takes on the new vulnerable position being the least cultural accepted form of assisted reproduction. The changing notions of kinship uh, that are provoked by arts and surrogacy, they are placed in the fourth industrial revolution we are living in, in which digital, phys physical and biological technologies are put in place together. In Schwab's words, and I'm quoting, uh, they stand on the brink of a, technology, of a technolo technological revolution that will fundamentally alter alter the way that we live, work, and relate to another. This economist is saying that it will change not only what we are, but also what we do, and will affect our identity. Technologies exceed our bodies. If it was not because of technology, this conference wouldn't have reached half of its audience. I won't be projecting this PowerPoint to, exp to expand my communicating abilities or inabilities. But there are much more radical ways to exceed our potentials. We have uh, emergent cases of brain death pregnancies uh, that offer examples of this transcendence, making it possible to maintain a dead body functional in order to keep a fetus alive after the brain death of the pregnant woman. Also, we know that it is, that it is now possible to have a fertilized egg with the genetic code of three different people in order to prevent genetic disease. But when technologies happen to be special disruptive to traditional principles, society experiences a crisis of moral values and legislations come into scene, as we know very well, in order to control that uh, disruptive power. Surprisingly, the Portuguese law uh, was approved with the votes from the white ring, right wing members of parliament. In fact, the proposal was to legislate surrogacy in altruistic terms in order to compensate for a pathologic absence 
Uh, and this offers a conciliation with the moral principles and good manners of a tra traditional Catholic society like the Portuguese, not offending at least too much the public order of the Portuguese state. So we understand that the proposal based on choice and reproductive work instead of patho pathology and altruism would never be so promptly approved. In the opinion, opinion of Marta Costa, uh, she's a lawyer that I interviewed. Uh, she said, I think for society, it is much easier to accept an altruistic gestation than a paid one, because it is less shocking from the point of view of manners. People tend to think, oh, it could be my sister. I don't think that the fact of being altruistic or paid significantly influences the, uh, the benefits for the parties, for the involved parties. It influences society instead, from the point of view of good manners. Apparently, the use of, technology, of technologies with transgressive potential for social changing is inversely proportional to the hierarchy of reproduction. That is, the more transgressive to social order technology is, the less it is likely to be accessible. This contributes to explain why for years the Portuguese legislation on reproductive technologies protected the heterosexual couple, and now goes on protecting the female identity as a reproductive body to the extent that it is culturally more acceptable to give a child the right to be born from a brain-dead mother than to be brought, born from a gestational surrogate of two fathers. In this regard, Ana Maria Mat Ana Matos Pires, a psychiatrist, uh, she noted that uh, the pro-life movement is defending the child of the science when it comes to the dead incubator. But a couple of months ago, they were defending nature, nature to justify the no to co-adoption. It's the absolute paradox. So, technologies offer people new ways of living, new structures, new norms, new morals. Technologies have the power to travel and reinvent the limits of parenthood, who can become a parent and how. This way, technologies, this way, the changes, in, the changes imposed by surrogacy when performed by gay couples or single men create not only a change at the individual level, once they can reproduce without having uh, intercourse with a woman, but also at the, at the family institution and social level where conjugality is less and less attached to reproduction, pregnancy is no longer attached to parenthood and blood type and care is no longer, uh, no longer attach, attached to femaleness. Another important aspect I find in the trouble potential of, potential of surrogacy, yes, it's, 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 its attempt to perpetuate the binary sexual system while exposing its fragility at the same time. By keeping surrogacy away from men's reproductive rights, the Portuguese le legislation reinforces the stereotype of reproduction as an essential function of women. Actually, it may seem pretty fair that if it's natural for a woman to reproduce by getting pregnant, then if she has any condition that prevents her from doing so, she will be offered alternatives in order to procreate. On the other side of the sexual system, Men do not get pregnant because they do not have uterus, and because of that, they are denied recognition as important actors in the parenting narrative. We already know that gender is a social construction, meaning that social roles attributed to men and women are culturally established fictions. However, we cannot overlook the fact that these social fictions go beyond gender roles. It is not only genders that are multiple, but also what we call biological sex. When medicine establishes female as the body with vagina, uterus, ovaries, XX chromosomes, and so on, it is also a way to social invent and delimit sex. In the words of Alice, Alice Drager, the way we choose to categorize and, and delineate males and females and others is basically a social decision. This discussion takes us to the recognition that one cannot associate uterus with women because there are women who have no uterus and are, there are men who have uterus 
And I'm not only referring to trans-identified people. Besides the already mentioned Rokit Rokitensky cases, like Joanna's, there are people ascribed with female at birth that instead of a uterus have internal testis, testicles. Furthermore, there are people born with penises who lack testicles, having a uterus and ovaries instead. Sexual characteristics come in multiple combinations. There is no such a thing as two opposite sex. So, when a scribed female is born with vagina and ovaries but without uterus, this has nothing to do with being more or less feminine. This has nothing to do with being born without part of her femininity, as said during the news in one public Portuguese TV channel, when referring to Joana. Although surrogacy legislation in Portugal is trying to keep the two sexes essentialized in physical and nature, and in, and in function by, re by reinforcing the natural reproductive capacity of cisgender women, it is denouncing the vulnerability of two apparently monolithic sexes. So, surrogacy must be debate, debated, having in mind the multiplicity of sexes, not as a matter of an alternative for women's health issue, but as a matter of fundamental rights for everyone. In Perciado's words, sexual, sexual difference works as a legitimation of the political organization of society. And this is the same political organization that established the gap between gay and father, notions that are considered mutu mutually exclusive. This organization that puts people like Alvaro to a new position of reproductive vulnerability. The organization that regards gay men as sperm donors, but not as leading parental figures. The right to pregnancy, even if proceeding in another body through technologies, should not be stuck to rudimental ideas of sex, as long as it respects, of course, the fundamental rights of the gestational carrier, surrogacy should be open up for those who wants to procreate regardless of the legally established sex and sexual characteristics, because if there's a solution, then no one should be left out. Okay, thank you. <laughs>